Okay, it's going to be a review of TNA Slammiversary 2024. This is actually from Montreal. And uh, yeah, man, it was a pretty good show. It was actually the biggest TNA crowd in over 10 years, maybe since uh, lockdown 2013. But, uh, but yeah, if you haven't seen this yet, it was pretty damn good. I, I would definitely recommend checking out the last two matches. But, you know, throughout the whole show, I, I thought more than anything, it, it felt like a crowd that was uh, connected to the product. And, you know, I, I, I can't say I've been the most loyal you know, fan to current day impact or TNA over the last year. But, uh, but I got to say, I, I think, I think the show had a tremendously hot crowd. Uh, the biggest surprise of the night ended up being Earl Hebner. You know, I, w- I was hoping for AJ Styles, but, uh, it ended up being Earl, which was genius because it's not just a kind of a Montreal thing with Earl, but it's also a slam anniversary thing. But, uh, but we'll get that. We'll get, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, first match on the show, we actually have Matt Hardy. I would definitely say Matt Hardy, probably the biggest, you know, name on the show from from a legend standpoint, uh, taking on JDC. Um, wasn't much of a match. You know, they kept it short and sweet. JDC actually comes out um, with a whole bunch of, uh, you know, USA, you know, ring attire on his pants and his uh, jacket. You know, I, I thought he got good heat. I think Matt Hardy was treated like a legend here. I mean, it, it was it was pretty good stuff. You know, I think Jeff had just gotten taken out on the last impact had to go to the hospital i think that was because of the system though but uh yeah matt hardy gets a nice little victory over uh, jdc doesn't overstay its welcome hits a twist of fate off the top rope then hits him with a couple of more twist of fates uh to end this thing i didn't think matt looked great um but you know they kind of tried to work around the weaknesses and it was just it was just a, a fun little opener here it was probably the weakest match on the whole show uh next up you actually had the uh tna tag team titles you actually had uh the system this is brian myers and eddie edwards coming out there with alicia edwards to take on abc abc is actually ace austin and uh chris bay I gotta say, I think the match was pretty damn good. You know, ABC was really over his baby faces. The system got some good heat here. They were chanting, fuck the system. Um, you know, Alicia Edwards was really a good heel here. I mean, she's really kind of embracing being, you know, she almost reminds you of like, you know, the, the very, very rare, like really bad girl at school. And uh, she did a good job here, just, you know, choking guys while the referee wasn't seeing them, just really being bitchy towards the camera. So she was good. Uh, Myers hit a beautiful spear, you know, out of nowhere, which was good. Uh, I I think Eddie was all right here. But, you know, the days of Eddie being, um, you know, one of the best in the world are just over. But, you know, he was just kind of more in character here. I can't say Eddie looked great. I'm still not a big fan of his physique and his ring attire. But, uh, but you know, the story of this match was Ace Austin and Chris Bay. I, I think I think Chris Bay looked really good, really athletic. Uh, Ace Austin hit a Fosbury flop. Just some good tag action from them. Some beautiful Ace Crushers to end this thing. And uh, obviously they go over. They, they're the new tag team champions. And a uh, nice little fun match right there. I would definitely say one of the best matches on the show. So it's not just a great double main event. I, I think the tag title match... And even some other stuff following this is definitely worth checking out. That's definitely one of them. Uh, Next up, we're going to go to the most underrated match of the night. This is Mike Santana taking on Jake something. They don't get much time here, but huge spotlight for both guys. Uh, You know, great opportunity for Santana. You know, he's kind of been in and out of AEW over the last couple of years. Uh, This is his return to TNA. I think he was actually in LAX. Must have been way after the uh, Conan days. But, uh, yeah, huge match for Santana. Uh, if you haven't heard of Jake something, you know, he actually wrestled in the um, the Ultimate X match at the opener of Slammiversary last year. And I think he's the former AAW champion, uh, which is a promotion in the Midwest. Uh, his name is really Jake something. You know, the, the only time I remember someone using the name something was was I think it was a band called Deep Blue Something. Was was that it? It was it was during the nineties and everyone thought that was like a joke, but it was like, yeah, their their last name is really something. But you know, uh onto the match though. It was good. It was good stuff. Uh I thought these two guys, you know, made the best out of the time that they got. I thought there was a sense of urgency. Jake Jake was doing, you know, topes over the top rope, which looked like he had a tough time, 
you know, clearing it, but he, he did a good job. I mean, there were some great, uh, you know, cannonball flips that were actually caught in midair from both guys. Santana gave him a whole bunch of stiff lariats to end this thing. So, yeah, I, I think it was good. I, I think, you know, some people might be overrating it a little bit. I, if, if, if I were to find the biggest flaw in this match, I just felt like after the first couple of hot minutes, I thought they kind of lost the crowd a little bit. But overall, give them credit. In some ways, this felt like a, not necessarily a tryout match, but just a great showcase of two guys that, you know, really are trying to, you know, get back to the spotlight or make it, try to elevate themselves uh, in the industry. So it felt like a, felt like an important spotlight match for them. I mean, one-on-one -on -one a Sam to me, it's a pretty big deal, especially when you got AEW and WWE possibly looking at the show as well. So... Uh, next up, great little match right here. I thought this was I thought this was fun. Actually, I'm not going to say it was great. I, I definitely think you could see some flaws in some of the NXT guys here. Uh, so this is actually no quarter catch crew. A lot of these guys actually do wrestle for uh, NXT. We got Charlie Dempsey, Miles Bourne, and uh, Tavion Heights. If there's one guy I think I've seen, it was probably Tavion Heights. But a lot of these guys have not wrestled on um you know nxt premium live events yet so if you've been watching the the nxt on usa you're probably more familiar with these guys i just don't watch a lot of uh nxt on television but uh you get this team tagging up to take on the rascals reuniting so trey miguel actually reunites with wesley and uh zachary wentz and it was good, man. It was really, really good stuff. I, I, I would say this about No Quarter Catch Crew. I think, you know, they they just did a lot of isolations, a lot of good a lot of good knees from them. They, a lot of these guys threw some really, really heavy knees and some good backbreakers. But I think there's room for for improvement from everybody out there on the uh, on this No Quarter Catch Crew team from NXT. You know, I, I just think the Rascals really carried this match in terms of their athleticism, in terms of the spots. I mean, they, they were awesome, especially Trey Miguel. You know, Trey Miguel is the homegrown talent from TNA. So, uh, you know, Wesley looked great. There was some really, really fun stuff here. I, I mean, the highlight would be, I think it was Charlie Dempsey. He did like a dragon suplex and, and he bridged for the pin. And then I think it was Wesley. He broke it up with like a beautiful elbow drop like halfway through the ring it looked really really cool so shout out to uh, charlie dempsey for taking that bump you know to do a bridge and f for all that weight to come down on he was pretty pretty uh crazy but yeah I, you know what I i'm not gonna say the match was great i thought it was really good it actually did get some this is awesome chance i don't know if it really deserved it. it it had me thinking of that match uh between brian danderson and brent albright where the fans were actually chanting this is de this is decent if anything i, I would say it deserved you know, mild, this is awesome chance, but, you know, uh, give them credit. I just think the Rascals uh, had a really, really good showcase here. If, if anything, I would say this. I, I, would, I would say this is cool because of, you know, letting the NXT guys uh, be showcased here. I, I think it's beautiful. I, I think it's great stuff. I don't think it hurts NXT or TNA for these, these guys to work together. I think everybody, you know, Everybody eventually is going to be a free agent. So in the long run, I think it's great for the whole industry to keep doing stuff like this. So thumbs up there. I think the match is really, really solid. Uh, all right, next up we have PCO taking on AJ Francis. This is for the uh, AJ Francis's TNA digital media title. And he's also the international heavyweight champion this is a montreal uh street fight uh aj francis actually comes out with a whole crew of dudes josh bishop rich swan and we have uh the rapper the famous rapper smoke dizza who actually did an album with pete rock um I th what was it it must have been 2016 uh so yeah shout out to pete rock um all right Really entertaining match right here. If you haven't seen AJ Francis yet, I think he might be from MLW. I feel like I saw him do something wacky on the street in, in MLW. But, um, you know, he he has ring attire that's like full of money. He's actually wearing Jordan 1s that are all green. So, you know, really reminds me of a cross between Suge Knight and, uh, 
you know, the uncle from the Fresh Prince. Like, really, really reminds me of that. Lots of charisma, uh, but at the same time, he he he's not very likable. He definitely got a lot of heat here. Uh, PCO was treated like a god. You know, PCO is actually, I think he's actually from Montreal. You know, he's formerly one of the Quebecers. Uh, he's a former Ring of Honor champion. Uh, I'm not the biggest PCO fan, but, you know, he's getting up there in age. He definitely looks like Frankenstein. He had a really, I would definitely say, like a sting-like over-the-top entrance, you know, coming out of the coffin, coming down from the rafters. It was pretty damn cool. I, I think the match was fun. I'm not going to say it was great. Uh, I, I, You know, PCO had a lot of fans in the front row wearing his shirt, and, uh, you know, he, he was definitely, you know, just like just like Mike Bailey. He was actually the hometown boy here. So, yeah, two hometown kids. You had PCO and Mike Bailey, but, you know, the, the crowd was really into PCO. I mean, some of his moonsaults were actually beautifully executed here. There was a ton of, uh, you know, crazy stuff, a ton of overbooking. I think he actually had Trent Seven and Rhino come out to neutralize Smoke Dizza and, and Rich Swan and all those guys. Uh, but yeah, there were some incredible uh, choke slams on chairs. Uh, AJ Francis did take some crazy table bumps. Um, but hey, you know, PCO actually does go over with the moonsault and wins two championships. And he actually asked that girl out. And or no, the girl comes out and asked uh, to marry PCO. Actually, I, I forget what her name was. Uh, Stephanie Leander, I think it was. Um, but hey, man, we're gonna move on to the TNA Knockouts title match. So I, I think the PCO match was fun. I, I, I'm just gonna say this. I, I just think it was really about the overbooking and the hardcore stuff. I, I can't say that. You know, after watching this match, I could tell just how good AJ Francis is. But you know, it it was definitely a great a great um, a great night for PCO because I think the the stipulation and just the environment really really suited him well. You know, for the Montreal fans, if, if you know if you know what I'm saying. All right, next up for the TNA Knockouts World Title, we got Jordan Grace uh, taking on Ash by Elegance. Um, so if you haven't seen Ash by Elegance, she's actually uh, Dana Brooke. Uh, I was not a big fan of this. Uh, I would definitely say this is one of the weaker matches of the night i would i would actually say this is weaker than jordan grace and roxanne uh from nxt's battleground i thought that was a good match i just thought you know that uh didn't get the green light to deliver uh, a lot of it had to do with you know they they wasted too much time trying to set this match up um i just feel like this i i think you know one of the issues with tna right now and it's more of an issue with the women i mean you could argue since day one you know tna has you know, overdid it with trying to showcase former WWE names, but especially right now with the women's division, and I got to say what they did with Naomi last year as well, it, it, it just feels like they need to do a better job when it comes to the bigger show, Slammiversary, Bound for Glory, Hard to Kill, of, you know, putting Jordan Grace against girls that could, um, you know, match up with her. It just felt like this girl... Could not keep up with Jordan Grace, um, Ash by Elegance. I, I thought she looked average at best. Her execution on uh, some of the moves here, especially the the backcracker, uh, just did, didn't come off well. She actually did. Give her credit. She busted out a Canadian Destroyer. I, I just feel like, you know, everybody and their mother does the Canadian Destroyer now. And I, I just feel like her offense definitely brought the show down a lot of i thought she got a lot of heat here too i just didn't think she looked great she really fits the criteria of you know some of these women that you throw in a royal rumble and you know that's one of the reasons why the women's rumble kind of sucks i just feel like you know with jordan grace man she's such an awesome talent and, and, and jordan did good here i think she did great you know, she, she busted out the muscle buster, uh, busted out a lot of really, really good things. She actually ends up going over with the juggernaut driver, which is the Shingo Welcome to Japan. I thought she did some really good stuff out there. But I just feel like, you know, with Jordan Grace, she's such a great talent. It's it's just it's just tough because some of the best women in wrestling, it's like they're they're it's 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 like the you know, they're really like the only one in their division. Whether it be Roxanne, whether it be Jordan, whether it be Athena, whether it be, uh, you know, Bianca or, you know, even if you want to throw Charlotte's name out there. I, I just wish all the women were under one umbrella. Um, but, yeah, this was just not I, I just wish I'm trying to think here. 
man, they don't even have the pre-show here, but there was a women's match on the pre-show. It was like a five-way or a six-way, and it, it got a good reaction. I, I would have preferred any of those women in this match over, you know, Dana Brooke. I've never been a huge Dana Brooke fan, never really got into her, and uh, I just think it was a mistake. You know, if you wanted to do Dana Brooke and Jordan, I would have been cool if they did this uh, under siege or sacrifice against all odds, one of the TNA plus you know, pay-per-views, but not a $40 pay-per-view that everybody's going to check out. Um, but yeah, Jordan Grace goes over. I would definitely say probably the second worst match on the main the main show. Uh, next up, we got Mike Bailey uh, challenging Mustafa Ali for the uh, X Division Championship. This is definitely the match of the night. Uh, it was overbooked, but it was fun as hell. You know, Mike Bailey was awesome here. The, the highlight of the match for Mike Bailey, he had a couple of highlights here. I mean, the shooting star press that he hit on Mustafa Ali and Mustafa kind of just slithers away from the pin. Was, that, was, that was awesome. Uh, you know, Mike Bailey actually did the, he actually countered the baseball slide into the moonsault. That came off great. That's Mike Bailey's signature spot right there. Oh, the Spanish fly into the campaign was sick as hell that was really really cool so i could go on and on i thought i, I actually from what i've seen i think this is mike ba mike bailey's best match under the impact umbrella or the tna umbrella so far uh obviously he's had better matches in pwg and west coast but you know this this would definitely be better than i think anything i've seen uh from mike bailey in impact so far uh but yeah man mustafa ali was good i, I like the overbooking you know th there there was there was a, a the, the ultimate weapon spot, uh, Mike Bailey hit it. Mustafa got his foot on the rope, and the referee, you know, called called it back. I, I thought Mike Bailey won it in that spot, and then they're complaining. He's complaining to the ref, and uh, Mustafa. I think Mustafa actually super kicks the ref, so there's no referee. And then uh, Mustafa hits the 450 while the campaign is locking down Bailey, and so all of a sudden Earl Hebner comes out. In Montreal, he gets booed like crazy. And I thought it was cool to have Hebner come out. Uh, you know, it, it didn't get the reaction that this could have gotten in 2000. If this happened in 2003 during the Montreal nostalgia, like they would have booed the shit out of, uh, you know, Earl Hebner, the WWE's favorite son. But I don't know. You, you see, there's, there's still a lot of kids out there. Anybody that's, you know, under, I guess not 25, I would say like anybody under 25 or 28 is not going to really, you know, appreciate, you know, Earl Hebner of Montreal. So it, it got a good reaction. I think it got the reaction they wanted it to. But uh, what, what I thought was really cool about this as well is, you know, Earl actually helped Jeff Jarrett win at Slammiversary 2006. You remember, I think Jarrett paid Earl off to, to, to um, screw actually Christian in the King of the Mountain at uh, Slammiversary 2006. So... In some ways, you accomplish Montreal and the history of Slammiversary. So I thought it was genius. It was a good surprise, too, because, you know, th the pay-per-view didn't really have many surprises in terms of, like, special appearances. So love that about it. And then they, they do the sharpshooter stuff. So it, it looks like Mustafa and Earl are going to work together. And then Mustafa comes up to Earl and he's like, you know, I paid you off. He's like, what the fuck? Uh, and then eventually Bailey puts Mustafa in his own sharpshooter and uh, Earl Hebner calls for the bell. So they tried to tell this story of uh, Earl Hebner redeems himself in Montreal. Uh, you know, you saw Dark Side of the Ring where Earl is extremely, still feels really, really bad about, you know, the role that he played in the screw job. But hey, man, I know there's a lot of people out there that are really sick of Montreal and it's Montreal overload and Montreal oversaturation. But, and you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's funny though. It's not just WWE that tried to cash in on Montreal. It's, you know, we, we could still cash in on it with this angle right here in TNA. So it is what it is. You know, Mike Bailey is actually from Montreal. So, you know, maybe it does make sense when you think about it, but Hey, no matter how you look at it, I, I think the match was awesome. I think the overbooking was awesome. I think the stuff with Hebner, uh, was fun. I think this was this was definitely the match of the night. So so check it out. If you want to check out one match or two matches from this show, let it be this and obviously the main event. Okay, and on to the main event. It's Slammiversary. So I I, I actually enjoyed this call to stack the deck. Uh, you know, and Slammiversary. It's not a King of the Mountain match, but you know it kind of goes with the Slammiversary theme of a five way or a six way. This is actually a six way elimination match uh, for the world title. So Moose. 
is still the world champion um, going into Slammiversary. I, th I, th I think he beat Alex Shelley at Hard to Kill. Yeah, it feels like a long-ass time ago. I haven't seen Shelley in a long-ass time. I haven't seen Sabin either. Um, but, hey, Moose is defending against Frankie Kazarian. Believe it or not, Kaz is in the match. Uh, Joe Henry, who was the most over guy in the match. Josh Alexander. Uh, Nick Nemeth, who used to be known as Dolph Ziggler. Uh, we have and we have Steve Macklin. I would say Macklin was the most underrated guy uh, in this match. I, I actually thought he looked really good, not necessarily in terms of like moves and execution, but I think he he took a beating out there. I think he he played his role really well. He took ten German suplexes from Josh Alexander, and they said shades of Kurt Angle um, with with Josh doing the German suplexes. It wasn't just ten; it was like five on everybody, and then it was ten on. Um, on Steve Macklin. So, yeah, shades of Chris Benoit right there. Uh, Josh had a really, really good show. And Josh Alexander does turn heel. He actually turns on uh, Joe Henry. He gives him a low blow. And it's a full, full-blown full heel turn, though. Like, he starts just giving him, like, forearm shots right in the face, even after he's pinned. So, uh, yeah, Josh Alexander, finally a heel. I, I guess you got to go back to like the Ironman match he had with TJP, you know, back in, uh, you know, June of 2021. But yeah, it's been a long ass time. But, um, you know, Steve Macklin was actually the first guy to get eliminated. I think Moose speared him after about 10 minutes. Uh, you know, the shocker of the night was actually Joe Henry actually beating Moose. So, you know, he Joe Henry, if you haven't seen him yet, um, he's creating a lot of buzz. You don't even have to be watching, you know, TNA to, to know that this guy is really getting over. I would definitely compare it to, you know, what LA Knight did last year, uh, especially around money in the bank time. Like he's really, really getting over. I think it was either at Forbidden Door or Beach Break. Someone had a, a, a sign in the front row that said, I believe in Joe Henry. So he's really getting over. I think a lot of it just has to do with his uh, theme song. It, it goes like, I'll believe in Joe Henry. And you had everybody just singing it. Um, I, I mean, I can't say that the match really let me know how great of a worker he is. I thought he had his moments here. I've, there's other moments where I'm saying, all right, maybe there's still a little bit of room for improvement. Same thing with Macklin as well. I don't think Macklin is great. I think he's solid. But you had a lot of workers here that are, you know, I, I, almost on the verge of hit or miss. But, uh, yeah, Henry actually does uh, pin Moose, which was huge. But then after that, that's when Josh turned heel and uh, gave Henry the low blow, the spike pile driver. And he just he just he just clocked the shit out of him with forearms after Henry got eliminated. Um, all right. So there's actually a really, really cool spot um, by the stage where Nick Nemeth actually super kicks Frankie Kazarian off the stage into a table that pretty much took Frankie out of the match for like, you know, almost almost 15 minutes and uh we got the first like big time tna chant there was some huge tna chants after frankie took that bump but um but yeah we got a, we got a big showdown between nick nemeth and uh josh alexander they went at it for like five minutes uh nemeth actually goes over josh and then frankie comes out of nowhere you almost forget that frankie's in the match then him and nick nemeth uh, you know, work their magic uh, to finally end this match right here. And I think it was good. I think it was good stuff. I, I thought Frankie Frankie looked like he was in better shape than the last time I've seen him. I would actually say Frankie even looked better here than some of the early, you know, TNA stuff. The last TNA show I saw is was Victory Road 06, where Frankie got a surprise title shot against Loki. I would actually say Frankie looks like he's better now compared to that time which is shocking to me. I was really impressed with how good Frankie Kazarian looked. Just He just looked slim. A lot of his DDTs, a lot of his you know springboard stuff came out great. He actually hit the red eye, which, which Hangman Page you know, does time and time again. Uh, so Nemeth actually hits the uh, uh, variations of uh, Super Kick and then hits him with the, the zigzag. They're, they have a different name for it now, obviously, because WWE owns the you know, intellectual property rights for the, for, the, for the zigzag, I guess. Uh, but yeah, Nemeth goes over and then he celebrates with all the TNA champions from Jordan Grace to ABC to, you know, PCO. So it's a, it's a really, really good night for, uh, for Dolph. You know what? I, I really don't have a problem with Dolph Ziggler, uh, you know, becoming TNA champion. I, I thought he looked good in this match. Um, 
he's a cardio machine. He's a workout machine. I, I, I thought, you know, he looked really, really good. I, I thought he had the eye of the tiger. You know, to me, it's not really an age thing with me, with, with Ziggler. I, I do agree with Chase, though. We, we, we talked about this, uh, you know, when we did the podcast with True Slayer, and they even mentioned it on, on the first show. Like, if, if Ziggler was going to come to TNA, you know, like, why hasn't this been done, you know, earlier? But then when you really think about it, though, you know, that would take you right before the pandemic and, you know, impact at the time. It does feel like like this company has a lot more juice right now than they had in the past. So if you want to look at it from that standpoint, maybe this is the best time. But, you know, so that leads us to Nick Nemeth uh, going in the Bound for Glory as champion. Moose is not champion anymore, which is good. I, you know, I, I, w- I was actually pretty impressed with Moose. I would say this. I, th- I, was, I thought Moose had a good presentation here, part of the system. I enjoyed his ring attire. I thought he looked good in this match. I could see why, you know, TNA keeps on going back to him. This is like the second time I think they, they had him as champion for a long time. Um, but realistically, when we're talking about Bound for Glory and, and producing a match that people want to see, uh, I think Nemeth is definitely a better choice. So that leads us to, you know, do you, do you go back to Nick Nemeth and Frankie Kazarian? I would say highly unlikely. I mean, you would think Josh is going to wrestle Joe Henry at Bound for Glory. That had the most story to it. So I could definitely see Alexander Henry being a grudge match at Bound for Glory. I wouldn't have a problem with that. Um, so with Nemeth as champion, I mean, you could go back to Alex Shelley. Maybe you could do uh, AJ Styles. I know, I, I know, I, I actually said I thought I had a feeling like AJ was going to make an appearance here because they're doing so much stuff with WWE now with Jordan Grace and you saw, um, you know, some of the NXT guys on this show. So I thought maybe AJ might make an appearance. So who knows? Maybe you could still do Ziggler and AJ about for glory. Um, but I don't know. There's really not a lot of options. It'd be re- really interesting to see who Mike Bailey, you know, faces at Bound for Glory. I really wouldn't mind a rematch with Mustafa Ali because I thought their match was really good. But, you know, they definitely got to find some, you know, better girls for Jordan Grace uh, to go after. I, you know, Jordan Grace and Masha Slamovich have proven that they could produce a classic. I just, I guess that it's already been done. Uh, but yeah, they just got to find a fresh opponent for for Jordan. I mean, it's just, it's as simple as that. But uh, but yeah, I thought the show was fun. I, I think more than anything, what really impressed me was just the once again, it's in Canada, it's in Montreal. I just thought the environment was sick, had a great crowd. It, it just it just feels like night and day compared to Bound for Glory 2021, which was the first you know Impact TNA show I had I had watched in you know, almost a decade at that point. And you could just see the company feels a lot hotter now than it did back then. So I'll just end it right there. That's Slammiversary 2024. Uh, let, let me know what you guys thought of the show. Uh, uh, even on Cage Match here, it, it, it seems like a lot of people enjoyed the show. Got a really, really good rating. I'll just end it right there. So check it out. <laughs>